A spendthrift, whales, consumers, they go by many names, but I like to call them wallet gamers. You know, the ones that have been assisting the corporations in their mission to destroy the gaming industry and squeeze it dry. Now some may say to just ignore these whales and that destroying the industry is a bit hyperbolic. But is it? Is it Brian? Look around you. Can't you see Brian? Most AAA games are being solely designed for these types of gamers, if we can even call them gamers at this point. That's right boys and girls, we're coming out swinging right off the bat in this video because I'm sick and tired of these little degenerate weasels stroking off the corporations, buying up all the microtransactions because I've got the money to spend, oblivious to the irreparable damage they're actively causing in the industry. So fuckle your seatbelts and grab a nice cold bevy because we're taking the bullet train all the way to Whale City. Next stop, Whale City, home of the degenerate consumer. How much have you spent on Apex? 500, 2000, 250, 800, 3K on Xbox, 1.5K on PC, $3,000. WHAT THE FUCK IS WRONG WITH YOU?! This small sample size was taken from just two different Reddit posts where the Apex wallet gamers have come to congregate. And I totaled up the amounts from just these 10 individuals in the replies, which lands us at nearly $21,000 from just those 10 customers. Now for context, that means if the game were sold at 60 bucks a piece instead, and was not a free to play game with microtransactions, the game would need to be purchased by 333 different customers to reach that same dollar amount. And the thing is, these 10 individuals aren't done spending, because the game gets constant influxes of cash shop items weekly. It's crazy to think that when we look at just a small sector of the internet and see this kind of wailing people openly admit to, it's easy to see why Apex Legends has made over $2 billion in its first three years. Some publishers like Activision try to have their cake and eat it too, charging the full $70 for Call of Duty and implementing the same free-to-play systems found in games like Apex or Fortnite. And unfortunately, it's worked out great for them financially, with Modern Warfare 2 also making $2 billion. But not in its first three years like Apex, in its first three months. Now the figures above are rookie numbers compared to the gotcha gamers or free-to-play MMO players, easily getting into the five-figure range per person. I think 10k. I I'm not sure though. <laughs> Dude, I, I think I, I, it, might, it might be 10k. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, dude. That is insane. A absolutely I, insane. $10,000. Was it worth it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. I, I mean, look, it's like... like I'm gonna stop you right there, bro, before you embarrass yourself even further. But mobile gamers have got everyone else cleared by a mile. I've also played mobile gaming a lot. Not only do I play a lot of computer gaming, but I play a lot of mobile gaming. Okay. Been a part of a game called Clash of Clans, have over six figures invested into it. What the fuck? What the fuck? How do you spend a hundred grand on a fucking video game? It's almost impossible to comprehend that these people are even real, but they are. And like I said in the intro, most online games are being solely made for them now. And this is why those who say just ignore the cash shop or just ignore the whales are part of the problem. For one thing, you already know that that dude isn't ignoring the cash shop and he's probably a whale himself. But also because the cash shops are so successful, this means all the company's resources are focused on battle passes and cash shop items. Bugs, glitches, imbalances, lack of content, who cares? We just gotta keep the whales spending. So live service support starts to mean nothing when the support just means infinite cash shop updates with a small side of content. Now you've probably heard of the term pay to win and many would describe it as the ability to become more powerful in a game by spending real world money. But what exactly does it mean? So many people have different definitions by which they consider a game pay to win. And so many people have such different definitions of what winning is. Imagine a game with the ability to spend 20 bucks for an overpowered weapon, only obtainable in a cash shop, and not earnable in the game through grinding. I think most would agree that this is a prime example of pay to win. But some might change their stance if that weapon was then added to the game through 10 hours of grinding to obtain, but also left in the option to directly purchase it for 20 bucks. 
Is it pay to win or pay to take a shortcut? To me, there isn't much of a difference. Being able to obtain power quicker than others simply by swiping your credit card definitely falls under the pay to win umbrella. And we see a more complex problem in a lot of free to play MMO games with PvP, where paying for power level and upgrades is pretty common. And most high end PvP matches are determined by which whale spent the most amount of money. So wallet gamers are plentiful inside these types of games. MMOs, gacha games, mobile games, and paying for shortcuts to power, whether that be through the purchase of raw materials, pay for rerolled items, or even pay for loot directly in some cases. And pay to win certainly has a spectrum from somewhat of a gray area to flat out egregious. For example, skins in DMZ for Call of Duty that provide players with a UAV on spawn is definitely pay to win, but not nearly as bad as what Destiny 2 has become. Now I acknowledge that Destiny 2 is not the most egregious example of pay to win. There are plenty of examples worse than it in the free to play MMO and gotcha space, but Destiny 2 isn't a free to play game, which makes its pay to win problems that much worse. Actually it is free to play. Get the fuck out of here Brian, everyone knows that this shit ain't free to play. Pay to win in Destiny 2 isn't super obvious at a glance and it takes a bit more digging to recognize it, but both the PvP and PvE have had serious pay to win problems over the last few years, and Bungie are pretty good at hiding its pay to win tactics through its many layers of crafting materials and upgrade paths. A lot of people will now mention the slippery slope argument. Yes, Dado, we start with shaders, emblems, emotes. But who is to say that they won't introduce materials, armor, or weapons in the future? If we see legendary guns for sale, if we see legendary marks for sale, I'm gonna be mad. If we see something like 100 motes of light for $5, I'm gonna be mad. I don't wanna see power sold, I don't wanna see shortcuts to power sold, nothing. And as long as Bungie does not cross the line of cosmetic items, I think we'll be fine. If Bungie does cross that line, you have my rage. And you add these problems on top of selling exotic weapons through $100 pre-order bonuses and the ability to buy season pass levels, pay to win is very much alive and well inside of Destiny 2. But what about cosmetics? Cosmetics aren't pay to win, right? It's just cosmetic. One of the most common phrases wallet gamers love to use in justifying their whaling behavior. But in almost all video games, cosmetics dominate progression systems working towards unlocking camos, or helmets, or skins, emblems, whatever it is. These were all part of in-game progression and in-game achievements. So if instead players can just buy camos, skins, emblems, icons, and even entire armor sets, why bother with the progression systems? It doesn't affect you. Really? When the game is designed around earning cosmetics, then having a cash shop sell cosmetics absolutely affects me and the game experience as a whole for everyone. We've seen games like Destiny 2 not even get one earnable armor set in over a year for the core playlist, but loads of cash op sets are added no problem, and Bungie's recent state of the game blog post cites a lack of resources to make one new armor set to earn. How so? Just take the resources from at least one of those cash shop sets and apply it to the actual fucking game. Saying this shit doesn't affect me or the game is an asinine thing to say. I think of a game like Sea of Thieves, where the point of the game is to earn gold to buy really expensive cosmetics. But why grind for gold if you can just buy better looking cosmetics at the cash shop and the battle pass? I'm sure you have similar examples with games you've played or are actively still playing, and it eventually gets deflating to think about the fact that monetization has become the sole focus of so many of our favorite games. But these cash shops and monetization systems only exist and continue to thrive because of wallet gamers. So as much as we can villainize the corporations and greedy upper level managers for modern monetization practices, it's players, or should I say payers, like this, that really has led to the downfall of gaming. And even though the whales are a small percentage of users, they're responsible for more than 50% of the revenue, even up to 70% in some games. Now this is a terrible problem because this leads to many more studios to design their games, again specifically for this audience. Keep games running on just enough life support to stay afloat, but dump all the majority of resources into monetization. It's a vicious cycle where eventually these studios and whales will begin to destroy each other, if they haven't already. And as more time goes on, I've stayed further and further away from live service gaming in general, because wallet gamers, just like gambling addicts and collectors, can't help themselves. They are the epitome of impulse buying and always fall for FOMO. And just because they have the money, they spend it, casually destroying the industry, blinded by their compulsion to spend. 
truly pathetic behavior. Now I want to shift this video into a more positive direction and highlight some examples of games made for gamers, not for wallet gamers. And the first is a recent title, Baldur's Gate 3. Let's go ahead and read this here, okay? Are there any, this is a question that was sent to the developers, uh, Larian Studios of Baldur's Gate 3, asking about uh, in-game purchases. So they, are there any in-game purchases in Baldur's Gate 3? They respond. They say this. No. All right. No. Great. Uh, no, there will be no in-game purchases in our game. We believe in providing a complete and immersive gaming experience without the need for additional purchases. Enjoy the game to its fullest without any additional costs or microtransactions. I think, guys, we don't get a lot of those nowadays, you know? It's been a while since we've been able to hear this, and it's nice to hear it again. And we had the same thing with Elden Ring, and every once in a while games come out, and they're able to actually be for gamers first. And I understand that this has got a lot of people on Twitter upset, especially people that work at other gaming studios, because they're afraid of being held to the same standard. Baldur's Gate 3 is a complete package. A game created by individuals and a company that stands by their conviction that microtransactions do not belong in video games. It's no surprise to see it reach over 500,000 players on Steam this past weekend. Now this game is also an interesting case because just like with the release of Elden Ring, Baldur's Gate's release has AAA developers having full-blown meltdowns on Twitter saying that the game is an anomaly and not the new industry standard. Basically, lots of empty words and making excuses for why their billion dollar corporation that they work for can't reach the same levels of Baldur's Gate 3. That it's foolish to believe that this is the new standard. When in truth, these developers are just upset that Larian Studios has upstaged them in every single way. Again, just like when Elden Ring released. And all I'm gonna say is that a studio like this that values over delivery and encourages it, trying their best to satisfy their customers, and reject modern monetization practices should absolutely be supported. So after I finish this video, I'm going to immediately go purchase and begin playing the game. Grim Dawn is an ARPG released back in 2016, which was brought to my attention in one of my comments a while back, specifically when I was voicing my hesitancy to pick up Diablo 4. And thankfully, I did not buy Diablo 4 and instead took the advice of that comment and picked up Grim Dawn for six bucks. And wow. A feature complete, lengthy, and content rich ARPG experience without a single battle pass or cash shop. And in that time, they've released several expansions for the game, and several more free content updates since then, including a new fairly large update set to launch in just a few months. So if you were disappointed or fell out of favor with Diablo 4, I highly recommend picking this one up. Tunic is a fantastic little game that surprised me more than I thought, and while I haven't finished the game myself, I did watch my wife play through the game at various points, and even helped her clear a couple bosses. And this game absolutely blew away my expectations. I'd always heard it was a good game, but Tunic is truly one of the best games ever made. It's on Game Pass, so please, just go play this one. I spoke about Battlebit in a recent video which I recommend checking out if you missed it, but I wanted to bring it up one more time because of what a current DICE producer recently said in regards to Battlefield 2042. Obviously Battlefield and Battlebit are very similar games, and the community has been memeing on DICE and EA that Battlebit is somehow a better Battlefield game than 2042 is, and DICE producer Ryan MacArthur's response was, Players didn't understand how the specialists were supposed to work, and if you don't understand how something is supposed to work, of course you believe that the old way was better. Yeah. Or, maybe Ryan, you don't remove classes from a fucking Battlefield game, you doorknob. You guys weren't so ahead of the curve and clever with your generic specialist system, okay? Your players just aren't stupid. They saw that you changed the game to actively reject the identity of the franchise in which it belongs. So again, I'm here to reiterate, if you want a proper new Battlefield experience, go play Battlebit. And I've said it before, and I'll always say it, go play a Souls game, any of them. I recommend Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne to start out with. Those two are my personal favorites, but just pick whichever From Software game sounds the most interesting to you and dive in. There are no games that give more high quality content and feel more rewarding than From Software titles. Also check out some more indie titles. There are so many good indies out there. 2023 in particular has been a fantastic year for indies. Here's a few more recommendations. Check out my last video for some more recommendations. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you all in the next one.